right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Our second unit we're going to cover is called Chemistry and Biology. And this unit is exactly how it sounds. We are going to look at the chemistry and chemistry related concepts um, that we need to know in order to understand biology. So first we're going to look at atoms. Atoms are the building blocks of matter, which means everything is made up of, of atoms. Atoms can be broken up into three subatomic particles, which are protons, neutrons, and electrons. So when you hear the word subatomic particle, you need to be thinking about protons, neutrons, electrons. And when we talk about protons, neutrons, and electrons, you need to know the location and the charge of each. So I would recommend copying down this exact same table in your notes. Um, you will need to know this table. When we take a test, there's a very good chance that this exact table will show up on that test. So let's go through the table. Our first subatomic particle is the proton. Protons are located in the nucleus or in the middle of the atom and protons have a charge of plus one. So one way to remember protons is think protons start with a P and think positive. Okay, so they have a positive charge. Our second subatomic particle is the neutron. Neutrons are also located in the nucleus and they don't have a charge, so charge of none. So there are a couple Techniques I have to remember neutrons. So neutrons start with an N. They're located in the nucleus and the charge is none. Okay, so you can remember the letter N. Also, neutron sounds like neutral, which again means it doesn't have a charge. And finally, our third subatomic particle is the electron. Electrons are located outside of the nucleus and they have a charge of negative one. Next, I wanna start with a question. What do like charges do? So take a minute and think about, what do like charges do? So either two positive charges or two negative charges. And then a second question, what do opposite charges do? So what does a positive charge and a negative charge, what do they do? So hopefully, as you're sitting there thinking about this question, when you think of opposite charges, hopefully you're thinking of opposite attract. Okay, so what I mean by that is positive charges are attracted to negative charges. So I'm just gonna show like a positive being attracted to a negative. And like charges, meaning like two positives or two negatives, they're going to repel. All right, so now that we have refreshed this concept that opposites attract and like charges repel, we can talk about the structure of the atom. So the structure of the atom is going to result from the attraction between the positively charged nucleus and the negatively charged electrons. So if you look back at the previous slide, we introduced the subatomic particles and we stated that the proton is positive and it's in the nucleus. The neutron is also in the nucleus, but it doesn't have a charge. So the only charge in the nucleus is positive. Therefore, the overall charge of the nucleus is positive. Then surrounding the nucleus are the electrons, and the electrons have a negative charge. And we just established that opposite charges attract. So that positive nucleus is going to be the force that holds the electrons um, nearby, which is gonna hold the atom together. And another characteristic of atoms is that they are neutral. So when we talk about neutral, they're electrically neutral. Um, so that means the number of protons 
for the number of positively charged items or subatomic particles is going to equal the number of electrons or the number of negative charges. All right, next, whenever we're looking at one type of atom, um, where they're all the exact same type of atom, that is called an element. So elements, uh, they're pure substances, meaning that they're all made up of one type of atom, and they can't be broken down into any other substances by physical or chemical means. So what that means is if we take oxygen, for example, oxygen is an element, I can't physically separate oxygen um, down to any simpler substance. Um, so by physical, that'd be like filtering it, separating it, um, any of that. I also cannot do it by a chemical reaction. Okay, so that's what I mean by a pure substance. And all the elements are arranged in the periodic table. Um, and there is about 118 total elements. And about 100 of them are naturally occurring. When two or more elements chemically combine, uh, they form something called a compound. And so we just established that there's about 100 naturally occurring elements. Um, so those 100 elements they can combine in different numbers, so two, three, four, five, more. And they can combine um, all of the different elements in different quantities. Therefore, there are more than millions of different compounds on this planet. Um, so lots and lots of compounds. We will study a handful of them in biology. And a very common one um, is H2O, which is also known as water. A specific type of compound we're going to focus on in biology is called an organic compound. So when you see the word organic in science class, it means we're talking about carbon. Okay, so organic compounds are compounds that contain carbon. So some, some common compounds or organic compounds we'll look at are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And the reason why we focus on organic compounds in biology is because these organic compounds are generally associated with living things. Um, so in biology, when we look at the chemistry, almost every single compound um, we look at contains carbon. Therefore, it goes into this group called organic compounds. So whenever we talk about compounds, um, there's a couple of characteristics or just features or attributes um, about compounds. So number one, compounds always form in a fixed ratio. So I'm going to use water or H2O as my example. Okay. So when we look at a formula, the letters represent the elements. So H represents hydrogen, O represents oxygen. And then the little number here, this is called a subscript. The subscript tells you the quantity of atoms present, um, and it tells you about the element that is before it. So this two means that there are two hydrogens. If there is no subscript written, it means that the number one is implied. Okay, so I'm gonna put a green one there. Um, we don't write the one, but it's just showing you that there's one oxygen. Okay, so. What that means is whenever water forms, it always forms in this fixed ratio of two hydrogens to one oxygen. So water will never ever form as like, it will never be HO2. It's never gonna flip-flop those, okay? Again, it's never gonna be like H2O2, okay? Water is always H2O. Second, compounds are chemically and physically different from the elements that comprise them. So what I mean by that, water again is made up of H2O and we're all familiar with water. It's colorless, it's odorless, it's liquid at room temperature. Um, it's very stable, it says it's not very reactive. Okay. Um, but water is made up of 
hydrogen gas. Okay, so that's hydrogen gas. And it's made up of oxygen gas. So this is just how we would write hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Um, and water is different than both hydrogen and oxygen gas. So oxygen gas, uh, of course, we're familiar with probably a little bit more than hydrogen. But again, it's colorless, odorless. I um, mean, it's combustible. Hydrogen gas, also colorless, odorless, and extremely combustible. Um, so these individual elements are very different than the compound that they combine to form. And finally, the third characteristic is compounds cannot be broken down into simpler elements or other compounds by physical means. So when we talk about physical means, um, it's just like a simple way to break it down. Like you can't take a, a water molecule and pick out the hydrogens or the oxygens, um, or you can't run water through a special filter um, that would magically break it up into the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atoms. So if you want to break down a compound, it has to be broken down by chemical means. And so water, for example, the way you break water down into hydrogen and oxygen gas um, is to basically run electricity through it which is through the process called electrolysis. Okay, so compounds, they can be broken down into simpler substances, um, but it's difficult. It requires a chemical reaction. All right, so now we're going to talk about bonds. So we've talked about compounds and how compounds are two or more elements chemically combined. Um, so what combines them is the chemical bond. So a chemical bond it's a force that holds substances together. And by substances, I just mean elements in a compound. Okay, um, So it's what actually keeps this compound together. So when we're looking at water, it's holding together the two hydrogens and the one oxygen. So why don't they just separate? Okay, um, So there's a force there that actually holds those atoms together. And we call that force a bond. And whenever we look at bonding, the part of the atom or the subatomic particle that participates in the bonding is the electron. There are two main types of bonds. There are covalent bonds and ionic bonds. So we are going to look at covalent bonds first. So covalent bonds form when electrons are shared. Okay, so the keyword here is shared. So highlight, underline, star. Um, make sure you know covalent bonds form when electrons are shared. And an example of a covalent bonded compound is water. Okay, so we've already established water's formula is H2O. Okay, so there's two hydrogens for every one oxygen. So here are our two hydrogens, and here's our one oxygen atom. Now, most elements want to have a total of eight electrons in their outer shell. So we will write this in our notes. So it's called the octet rule. So most elements... want, I'm going to put want in parentheses because they don't really have a brain, they don't want, but physically, um, like the laws of physics, um, make them operate to want eight electrons. I'm saying outer shell. And then the more appropriate word is going to be the valence shell. Okay, so when we're talking about that outer shell, it's the valence shell. Um, the exception to this rule is going to be hydrogen and helium. They only want two electrons. Okay, so now that we know our octet rule, we know that all elements want eight electrons in this outer ring, except hydrogen and helium, which they only want two. Okay. 
So if we look at water, we look, we have our two hydrogens and one oxygen. So oxygen wants eight electrons in this outermost ring. And oxygen currently has one, two, three, four, five, six. So how many more does oxygen need to get to eight? Hopefully you said two. Now, if we look at hydrogen, hydrogen has one electron and it wants to get to two. So how many electrons does hydrogen need? Hopefully you said one. So each hydrogen is looking for one more electron and oxygen is looking for two more electrons. So what happens is these atoms combine and they end up sharing. Okay. Um, so if you look here, the hydrogen atoms have just moved in closer and they now share with the oxygens. So oxygens are still um, represented by the color red. So if you look, oxygen still has its original six. Hydrogens are represented by the color white. Okay, so they each are contributing their original one. But now they're sharing. So hydrogen has two. This hydrogen has two. Okay, and that's all they want. So they are good. They're physically stable. Oxygen now has eight which is exactly the number that oxygen wants. So by moving closer together and by sharing these electrons, all of these atoms have reached a stable configuration or they have a filled valence shell. Um, and because of that, it has formed this very strong bond and we call that bond a covalent bond. Between ionic and covalent bonds, covalent bonds are way more popular um, when we talk about biology. And that's because um, most compounds in living organisms are going to be held together by covalent bonds. And so there are three different types of covalent bonds. They can be single, double, or triple. So single bonds share two electrons. Electron can be abbreviated with an E and a negative charge. Double bonds hold four electrons, and triple bonds hold six electrons. And then finally, sometimes you'll see diagrams of covalent bonds, and a single covalent bond is just represented by like one dash line. A double bond is represented by two dash lines, and a triple bond is represented by three dash lines. And each of these dash lines represents two electrons. So a single bond is just two electrons total, which is why there's one line. A double bond has four electrons total. So this top line represents two electrons and the bottom line represents two. So two and two make four. Triple bonds have six electrons, so two are in this line two in this line, and two in this line. So two, four, six. So now I just want to um, pause and just do a quick vocab lesson, if you will. Uh, the word molecule is going to be used a lot in this class. A molecule is simply a compound, which is two or more elements chemically combined, um, but they have to be held together by a covalent bond. So anytime you have a compound that's held together by a covalent bond, it can be called a molecule. Okay. Um, so again, if you hear something that's a molecule, then you know it's going to be held together by a covalent bond. All right, now I want to talk about ions. Ions are atoms that either gain or lose electrons. And I am going to underline the word electron. Okay, so you should underline, star, highlight, electron. Um, so think, when it's ions, it's they're gaining or losing electrons. And so ions can either have a positive charge or a negative charge. Okay, and that just depends on if you're gaining electrons or you're losing electrons. And I'll go through some examples to show you how this works. And just some common ions that we see in living organisms are potassium ion. Um, so potassium is K and has a plus charge, so we call that potassium ion. Sodium ion, so sodium is Na and it has a positive charge. Calcium ion, so calcium is Ca and this one has two positive charges. 
chloride or the chloride ion. So it's chlorine with a negative charge. We call it chloride. And this last one is called carbonate. So it's CO3 with a negative two charge. So I want to use uh, my examples here to show you how do you know if the atom lost or gained electrons to become an ion. So the first one is the potassium ion. So it's potassium and it has one positive charge. And if you refer back to the very beginning of, of these notes, we started with those subatomic particles. And the only two subatomic particles with a charge were the protons and the electrons, okay? So protons had the positive charge, electrons had the negative charge. So if we look at potassium and we see it has a positive charge, it means that there has to be more protons than there are electrons. Now, if we go back to how ions form, ions only form by gaining or losing electrons. You cannot change the number of protons, okay? So when we look at how potassium ion forms, we have to only change electrons. So it's positive, meaning it has to have one more proton than it does electrons. So this means that this had to lose one electron, okay? So if we take away one negative charge, we have one extra positive charge, which is what makes it a positive. Our next example is sodium with a positive charge. Again, we have to have one more positive than negative. So again, we have to lose one electron. Next, we have calcium with a plus two charge. This means that there are two more positive charges or two more protons. So that means we had to lose two electrons. Now, if we look at the chloride, it's Cl with a minus one charge. So this one means we had to gain an extra negative charge. So this time we add one electron. And that last one is the carbonate. Um, this one is a little bit more complicated in general, but it has a negative two charge. Therefore, we had to add two electrons. All right, so when we talk about ions, it leads us into a type of bond called an ionic bond. So when you look at an ionic bond, you see the word ion. Okay. And ionic bonds form between the attraction of two oppositely charged ions. Okay. So kind of towards the beginning of this lecture, remember we established that opposites attract. Okay, so that means positive charges are attracted to negative charges. Um, so the example I'm gonna use is sodium chloride, which is your table salt. Okay. So sodium chloride, is composed of sodium, which is Na, and chloride, or chlorine, which is Cl. Okay. Um, this diagram comes from their just number of valence electrons, or outermost electrons. Um, sodium has one valence electron, and chlorine has seven. Okay. When we talked about covalent bonds, we talked about the octet rule. And the octet rule states that all elements want how many valence electrons? I hope you said eight. And of course we have hydrogen and helium, which are ex our exceptions, okay? Um, so they all want eight valence electrons. So if we look at sodium, sodium has one. How many electrons does sodium have to gain to get to eight? Seven, okay? Sodium is barely there. So what happens is it's actually easier for sodium to lose an electron, okay? So that's exactly what sodium does. So sodium loses this electron, okay? 
and it becomes sodium with a positive charge. Now, if we look at the chlorine, the chlorine has seven valence electrons, and it once ate it so, so, so very close. Um, so chlorine will take this extra electron that sodium wants to give up. Okay? So it now takes that electron, and, so, or, and chlorine gets a negative charge because then it has one extra electron. And we're left with sodium with a positive charge and the chloride with a negative charge. And what do we know about opposite charges? We know that they attract. So these two atoms are held together by this attraction between the positive ion of sodium and the negative ion of the chloride. Um, and so there's nothing like physically holding these together. Um, and they are just simply held together by that attraction. And it is a very strong attraction. Um, so kind of think similar to like a magnet on your refrigerator, right? That magnet is just attracted to your refrigerator um, and it just holds it together. So you can kind of think about that for an ionic bond. That positive charge is attracted to the negative and it holds the compound together.